The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Thanks for logging in early and getting set up. We've got a, a great webinar on tap for you today, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. If, uh, if you don't mind taking the time to let us all know where you're logging in from, city, and whether you're working from home or remote, uh, that'd be great. We love hearing from you all. Uh, I am here in Cleveland with Kelsey. Jim Vada is down in Cincinnati, and Mr. Parsons is in Elk Ridge, Utah. And uh, I don't know about the weather where you guys are, but uh, it's super rainy here and dreary in Cleveland. Yeah, that's just taken for granted in, in Cleveland, isn't it? That's, that's right. the norm. <laughs> Depressing. Indeed. <laughs> so we've got uh, we've got Simon in Nashville. We've got uh, Jeff uh, in Galleon, Alan in Santa Barbara. We've got uh, Paul. Welcome back from Oxford. Alex is in Reading, UK. Welcome back. I, I think that's the team from Open Reality. And if not, if you're not working with Open Reality yet, they're great partners we have over in the UK. Um, Constant. Uh, Constanian in Russia. I hope I didn't uh, get your first name wrong. I apologize if I did. Alex says yes, Rainy, where he is as well. We've got uh, Northern Nor Norway with Gertmund. Welcome back. Uh, Paul in Southeastern PA. Welcome back. Awesome. The thanks for the feedback. I'll get to some of these uh, after we get to the Q&A and get these shout outs done. Uh, thanks for all those responses coming through. Yeah, our friend in uh, Russia, I think it's Constantine. He's in. He says he's in Siberia, which is amazing. And he's, it's 10 o'clock at night there. So thanks for joining us. Yes, indeed. All right, so let's get started. We've got a, a great topic for you with uh, Keith Parsons. Jim's going to help us with Q&A and intros and, and being the color man as we go here, but uh, how a single frame gets transmitted on the RF medium is gonna be the main topic. I've got a couple announcements that I'm gonna walk through and then we'll get to the, the presentation today. Uh, as always, our webinars are certified by CWNP for continuing education credits. So if you need a certificate for attending today's webinar, just let us know and we're happy to take care of that for you. Uh, as the title suggests, we're not gonna get into any of the product tour today or do we ever on these Wednesday uh, webinars, though we do have some really interesting things coming out. Um, so you want to uh, be sure to, to stay in tune with what's going on with Seven Signals product. We're releasing uh, Mobileye for iGel Linux in October. So really exciting there, especially for our healthcare customers, manufacturing, finance and insurance, uh, where iGel is uh, and Linux in general are certainly popular. Uh, we've got some nice enhancements to Sapphire Eyes over the air mode. Um, so you'll want to take a look at that. And then also, you'll be the first to hear that um, Seven Signals coming out with a portable Sapphire Eye sensor this month. So we'll have uh, more on that next week. Um, and we'll have some collateral for you all to take a look at. So if you haven't seen a product tour from Seven Signal in a while, uh, please make sure you sign up for that. Um, if you want a copy of today's webinar, you can go to YouTube. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter, you can get access to our slides. We do share them there in a PDF. Uh, if you don't have Twitter, that's okay. You can email us. We'll share those slides with you there as well. Um, and we've got some winners from last week's trivia. Kelsey, uh, how did, how did uh, the folks do last week? Thanks, Don. So our trivia winners from last week, we had Dana Gray, David Mitchell, Albert Haynes, and Lawrence Gallagher. So congratulations to you all. You should be receiving some Seven Signal merch in the mail soon, and we will go ahead and pick some more winners from this week. Sounds good. And what what did the, what did we send out last week? Hats? Last week what, we sent uh, out some below? baseball hats. Correct. We're flush with hats, so we'll keep the we'll keep sending those out. Um, so thanks, Kelsey. Um, we'll get rolling along here. A little bit about Seven Signal for those of you who are new to us. Uh, the company was founded in 2007, hit a lot of major milestones along the way. We're really proud of uh, the networks that, are, that we're on through our customers, over 200 of those. We, hit, uh, we monitor over a billion data points on a, on a daily basis. We're on over 5 million devices. We're homologated in over 40 countries around the world, GDPR compliance. So we're not only keeping our technology stack relevant, um, but also staying relevant with our privacy. 
And the products, if you do hop on a product tour with us, um, we have 14 patents. So that means what you see from 7Signal, you are only going to see from 7Signal. Um, and we're here because connectivity depends uh, on, you know, the digital experience of your end users depends on connectivity. Um, and 7Signal has created a completely um, uh, outside in enterprise framework enterprise that framework brings visibility, brings visibility into the network. To the network. Uh, completely uh, completely device, device agnostic. agnostic. I'm getting a little getting feedback. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, uh, Kelsey. Uh, maybe mute the mic. All right, it's gone. Thank you. Um, so, um, what we're looking for that what we call the top seven Wi-Fi problems. Of course, these issues present themselves differently to the end user. Could be slow internet or unable to connect, but there's a root cause behind that issue, and that's what Seven Signal is getting to. Uh, and how we're able to do that is we're running active and passive tests on the network and on the device for things like packet loss, latency and jitter, a MOS score, having a full spectrum analysis with packet loss. Um, packet capture, excuse me. <clears throat> so I mentioned inside out approach. This is your traditional LAN. Uh, you've got great tools for your in infrastructure, whether that's from your access point providers, Aruba, Cisco, Extreme, et cetera, or um, other tools for your apps, whether it's AppNeta or other infrastructure uh, monitoring solutions from Riverbed or SolarWinds. That's not where Seven Signal plays. Seven Signal plays, uh, as we mentioned, from the outside in on the edge of the network, on the devices uh, with our mobile eye product, any Windows, Mac, Android, and soon to be Linux operating system. Um, so it's your, your handheld, your PCs, your tablets, your scanners, um, et cetera. And then also with our Sapphire Eye, that's our perfect client or sensor, soon to be a, a mobile or a portable sensor from 7Signal uh, that's measuring your service level quality and your RF. So real differentiation there uh, is a great complement to your existing tools. Uh, and we are offering a 50-day, um, 50, uh, 50 device trial for Mobileye as well. So if, for those of you who are having issues monitoring the devices from your remote workers, your work from home employees, uh, we're able to help there as well. And uh, Kelsey will drop in a few links to uh, not only our free trial, but also our product tour. So keep an eye out for those links as well, save you some time. You don't have to, uh, to write anything down. So uh, Keith was nice enough to put a couple of poll questions together for us today, some trivia stuff. And what I thought was interesting is I, I shot him a note yesterday and said, hey, do you have any trivia questions for today? And it typically takes our presenters, you know, a, a day or so to think through these things. And Keith sent uh, the trivia questions back within five minutes and they're pretty tough. So uh, we're going to throw one of them up here to, um, uh, to, to gauge uh, where our audience is. And then uh, Keith is going to help me with um, the responses and let us know how the audience did. So let me launch this first poll question here. Uh, so I'll read it to everybody. And same thing applies uh, that does every week. We're going to give uh, some seven signal swag to the first three uh, folks who answer this question correctly. So the question is, what is the percentage of time it takes to send one 802.11 frame dedicated to the actual data payload? So the options are less than 10%, 25%, 50%, or greater than 75%. Uh, and I see all these uh, answers coming in now, so I'll let that slow down. Got uh, up to we're up to 50% of the folks who voted. Let's see if we can get that up to 75 um, before I shut this down. All right, I see it slowing down here. Let's close the poll out and share the results. We got a lot of smart people here. We do indeed. This is a smart crew. They a lot of them come back week after week. All right, so it looks like 49% uh, said uh, less than 10%. Uh, Keith, is that the correct answer? That is the correct answer, or it depends. That was my answer. <laughs> I wasn't going to put that one up as one of the options. Yeah, but it's a small, small fraction is the important takeaway. Indeed. All right, so let me hide that poll. I'm going to hand the controls over to, to Mr. Parts, Mr. Parsons and uh, Jim, if you don't mind uh, doing a small introduction, that'd be great. 
Yeah. So if you don't know Keith Parsons, he is an industry veteran. He is CWNE number three. Um, and he is a very talented Wi-Fi engineer, um, consultant, trainer, and educator. Uh, you can find uh, out about uh, him and his company at WLANPros.com, uh, WLANProfessionals.com. Um, and you can follow him on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. And uh, he puts on the WLPC conference uh, globally now, which is always a highlight of my year when I get to go to that. And hopefully we'll be in Phoenix again next year. Fingers crossed. Um, and uh, and uh, follow him uh, online where you can find him. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, you seeing the screen okay? Yep. Good. So today we're going to talk about um, how a single frame gets transmitted over the RF medium. It seems kind of trivial, and yet when you when you delve into it, uh, we're going to get into some some fairly complex mathematics and some calculations to be able to see how we got to that answer for that first trivia question. Just a little slide about me. You can track me down. I, I have now 87 certificates because I took two more, two new certificates in the last two weeks. So it's my goal to hit 100 uh, certifications before I retire. So we're working on that one. Keith, I don't think uh, I could name more than like 30 certifications probably. This is amazing. 87. Yeah, it's my wife thinks it's a, a flaw in my character. I, I just have to keep going and get more. She goes, isn't an 87 enough? No, more, more. So, yeah, the last two were on um, were Fluke, how to do a certified cable testing technician on both copper and fiber. Learned a lot of really good things. So it, how else do you keep learning? So that's a little about me. Uh, you can hit, again, my website, wmpros.com. Well, what we're going to start talking today is about this little graphic I put together for a troubleshooting course we showed a, on a previous uh, Seven Signal um, webinar. But we're going to focus on the red box, the RF medium, how the RF medium itself works. So zoom in a little bit on just that box. Now, inside the box, there's a lot of features that, that are taking place, and they're live, and they're happening all the time. So you can see some of these little bubbles have a circle, little arrows going around them. That means they happen on and on. So we have from adjacent channel interference all the way down to spatial streams and retry rates and lots of stuff going on in the RF. Part of that is every device that's going to transmit has to go through a process of choosing how to transmit. So a transmitter is going to decide it's not the AP, it's not the client, it's Whichever one is going to transmit is going to go through this process. Uh, sometimes we call it the game on, on, on how individual devices go through and count down. There's a little bit of dead air to trigger that, oh, no one else is talking. And then if I want to talk, then I want to play in this game. I'll pull a random number and I'll count down. Now, we're not going to talk through that process today. Uh, after that's completed, now we're going to look at uh, how we actually finish the transmission. But the transmitter, whoever wins in that cycle, will end up choosing the modulation technique it's going to use, a coding scheme, how wide of a channel, whether or not guard intervals turned on, how many spatial streams to use. And some choose dynamically what the transmit power. Most stick with the single transmission power. So that decision is made by the transmitter frame by frame by frame. What we're going to try to focus on is how that uses up airtime because airtime is the thing we have least of in Wi-Fi. So how do we make the airtime as efficient as we can? I love the MCS table. I have to show it every time I talk to anyone because if you understand this and how clients move around in it, it will help you troubleshoot your network all sorts of different ways. Do clients go up the column? Do they go diagonal? Do some go to the top and bottom? Your clients are pre-programmed to act a certain way. And if you don't understand how they're going to react, then it's really hard to, to fix what's going to happen. So know that. Now, I had mentioned this contention process. When there is a, a time available, a transmit opportunity, then the game is played. There is a preamble detect. 
to make sure that no one else is talking. And by the way, preamble detect is set to detect at a very low signal, like 4 dB above the noise floor. So it doesn't take very much to uh, understand that there's a preamble on the air. Preambles are also always sent at the lowest possible data rate, BPSK. So it's a really low modulation, which can punch through a lot of noise. So preambles can travel a long distance and basically have a large area where they cover and make other devices stop. It keeps the collisions down. Because if you hear me, you hear my preamble, you stop transmitting, you stop playing the game basically, then I get a transmit without having a collision. There's another form of detection called energy detect. Energy detect is about 20 dB hotter than preamble detect. So you could say, well, and you should say, that Wi-Fi is 100 times more sensitive to other Wi-Fi than it is to non-Wi-Fi. So sure, a microwave oven or a Bluetooth or anything else in the same frequency can cause Wi-Fi to stop. We have a detection mechanism, energy detect, but it's 20 dB, 100 times less sensitive than our preamble detect. Then we have this transmit opportunity. And during the transmit opportunity, there's some components, part of its wait time, a SIFS or a DIFS or an AFES, some form of wait time, usually dependent on whether or not we have QoS turned on and then it will change that wait time. But there's some dead air that says no one's talking. And then that triggers time to go and attempt to transmit. But I can't attempt to transmit directly because if everyone on the same frequency all listened to the dead air and then said, oh, it's empty, they would collide when they try to transmit again. So after we have dead air, then we have a random back off timer. So I pull a random number from a certain pool, depending on what QS I'm in. And then I count down random slots and then I win. And when I transmit, I send the duration ID, tells everyone else to shut up. There's also a little piece in the preamble that when I send my preamble, there's a length field that will also make people shut up for a certain length of time. So all of that is just to get access to transmit on the medium. Now, once I start transmitting on the medium, there's a whole lot of parts. And these are the parts we're gonna talk about. A single frame. It looks something like this. First up is a interframe space. This is the dead air I'd referred to. We'll just call it AFES because, well, when I try to remember AFES, I think of adjustable, it's actually arbitration, but it's a different size depending on my QoS, and that's time. That's just flat out time. Dead air for a certain amount of time, and then there's a contention window, and in the contention window, we're going to have random backoffs, and that's gonna be some average time. If our random backoffs are from zero to 31, we could guess we're around 15 on average slot times. Again, just time. So those first two things are just more dead air. The dead air for the apes, the dead air for the random time, but it kind of moves around. And then we're gonna have whoever wins that will have a chance to transmit. Now when they transmit, they're gonna transmit, first up will be a preamble. Preambles are always sent at BPSK, again, to, to travel a long way, make a lot of people shut up. And then there is a RTS, sent at the minimum basic rate, and then a SIFS, fixed amount of time. Then there's another preamble in front of the CTS, and then there's another SIFS, and then there's another preamble that's BPSK, and then a VHT preamble, and then a header that's set an MBR, and then finally we get to the payload. In our little graphics here, the payload's the blue part, and the payload goes at whatever the phi rate is. So remember a little while ago, we talked about the transmitter is gonna choose MCS, channel width, S uh, SGI, et cetera. This is the only part that that was changing. The payload is the part that has its own unique MCS. And then after the payload is sent, there's a CRC, little teeny thing, really. And then another SIFS, another the preamble, and then an ACK. An ACK's probably in this case a block ACK if we're running in QoS. That's what it takes to send a single frame. Once we decide we won, it's our chance to transmit, then we're gonna send all these little pieces. All of these little pieces take time. Let's find out how much time each of those pieces take. I'm showing you two separate calculators. The one on the left is from Aruba, 
And at the end, the last slide, I have uh, links where you can download and play with these on your own. And I strongly, strongly recommend that you go and, and get this Excel spreadsheet and play with it to see what the effect of different decisions are. In our presentation today, I'm going to show you some that I've pre-canned, but you can play with it to your heart's content and learn. The one on the left is from Aruba. The one on the right is from Germund. He's on today. Hello. Uh, go have some fun running in the forest, chasing your your uh, wet. He does he does this sport where he runs around in a forest, and his forests are swamps. So I don't know. Anyway, yeah. I live in the in desert. There. I don't have swamps. Well, I, I also don't have forests. So he's up in so, northern Norway. So very like northern Norway. Utah. Yeah. Sure. And he made the one on the right, and I'm only showing you the, the non-AX uh, versions today. If you want to get into the more, all of the features that are in AX, Germans also has on the right side of what I'm showing you on how to evaluate the RUs and the, the fancy features that come out with 802.11 AX. Today we're just going to talk about AC. So if you look at the numbers here, so I'm going to bring my little cursor over. Uh, my cursor is not showing up where I want it to show up. Anyway, uh, if you look on the screen, left side box, uh, these are just a list of the things that are happening. The little green box on the left, there's the ACE, that takes a certain amount of time. This one's currently set to best effort, that's what the BE means. And there's a contention window. Those two numbers are in microseconds, millions of seconds, and that's how long they take on average that since there is a random window, it's not, it could be lower or higher depending on what your random number you call. So we're just gonna put in the average here. And then there's a preamble, and then there's RTS, and this SIFS, and a preamble, and a CTS, and the SIFS, and another preamble, and a VHT. So that's what all these things are listed. And then when you change the little orange box to the top are the options. First option up is, what data rate are we gonna be sending our control and management frames? This is separate than our MBR, which is for data frames. This is for control and management frames. If you set it to the default of six meg, here's the answers that you'll get. We then set the payload data rate, how fast do we want to send their data. On some systems, we call this minimum basic rate, MBR, or you can adjust it, depends on your vendor, what the actual number is. And in this case, we've set it to 24. We set the size of the payload, in a minute, I'll show you some slides about how big payloads actually are. This one currently is set at 300. And then how many uh, MPDUs are put together. It's a way to aggregate data together. You can just set it for one. You can play with seeing what happens, but in all the exercises I did today, I just set that at one, which then shows you how big your average MPDU size is. And then we take that number and we plug it into the rest of the information. So in this Excel spreadsheet, you're only changing the things in the orange box. The rest of it's calculated for you automatically. And on this one, it has something different than Garamond's. This one shows the percent of air time with CSMCA, sorry, CSMA, whether or not we have the, we're counting the time of the waiting. Now, I totally think you should count the time of the waiting because in the real world, you're going to have to wait. And then, show the percentages that show up there. So if you look on this one, uh, the current data, and the data on this one, if you look down the line, we have the MPDU. That's the actual data itself. And if you look at the right, it's showing about 22%. So if we had set these to these numbers, we'd be using up about 22% of the airtime. So the quarter of you who said between 25%, for this example, you were right. Uh, for some other examples, you'll see different answers. So that first trivia question really should have been, it depends, because it depends on the factors that are going on at the time. Now remember back, the very first thing we said, transmitters choose their MCS. That only changes this one line. All the other things are fixed based in the protocol. So let's take a look at them. Here are some percentages. We took a, and just graphically showed. On this slide, if you look on the left side, it's a 90-byte frame. There's a whole bunch of these little 90-byte frames when we're running in Wi-Fi because in Ethernet, we have TCP running. 
TCP, it says data ACK, and the TCP ACK is 90 bytes long. So if we're running TCP on our protocol as our protocol, we're going to have a whole lot of these coming back. So it's one of the frames that we're going to see a lot on Wi-Fi. So as an example, a 90 byte TCP ACK, and we're including the arbitration time, that's the dead air for the AFES and the contention window. In this case, it's taking about 40% of our time, 34%. And then our protection mode, RTS-CTS, is taking another 22%. The payload itself is taking 23, but that's counting its own headers and its own preamble. The actual payload itself is a little teeny, teeny slice. And then our block act, which includes its own preamble, its own uh, SIFS time in front of it, and the block act is taking about 15%. So the only part that's actually data that's going to cross the wireless to wired boundary and come out the ethernet port is the blue part. Wi-Fi is terribly inefficient. It is not really good user of airtime. As a steward of the thing we have least of is airtime, Wi-Fi sucks. It doesn't do a good job of delivering that. But what it does do, one, it's really cheap because the protocol's free and chipsets are really, really cheap. So it's really easy and cheap to get distributed. But it doesn't do a good job of airtime. But because of all these features, we are able to use Wi-Fi, RF, and transmit frames over the air without any control. There's no cell tower telling which client to go when. This is a distributed coordinated function, meaning nobody's really coordinated. Everyone's just making their own decisions, and yet it still works. It's not efficient, but it's very good at working in constrained, difficult environments. I would mentioned earlier, let's talk about size of frames. So here's an example from uh, Aruba. They sat in their offices and ran and listened to all the frames for 30 minutes in one of their, in their corporate office. And here's the results. The left side are smaller frames, the right sides are larger frames, and then the back rows are which channel they happen to be on. You can see there is a whole lot of little teeny frames. One of those is because the way TCP works, it has all of those little baby 90 byte acts which come back, plus all sorts of other things. So if you look on the right side of the frames, on both 2.4 and 5 gig, over 80% of all the frames we send across Wi-Fi are less than 256 bytes. In 5 gig, that's closer to 90%. It's a really big number of spending, sending a lot of baby frames, which also goes to tell you, wait, Wi-Fi has a whole lot of overhead for that little teeny blue part. Yeah, it does. Let's compare some of the things we talk about. Many times we talk about things like, I need to go faster, or I need to go to 40 megahertz wide channels, or I need, I need, and we talk about that data rate like it's everything. It's really not. Let's do some comparisons here. First up, on the top part, I'm comparing nothing. They're the same. I'm just showing you what it takes to send one data frame. If you look at the, the details, it's a 512 byte frame. I could have put in 256s or less when I was playing with this. I pick 512 to be ultra conservative. It's actually worse than this. And it's a 512 byte frame, sending a data rate, a high MCS 86.7, that's an MCS 8, that's as, nearly as fast as you can go in a 20 megahertz channel, with that size payload and with a six meg um, control and data frame rate. So that's the, the numbers we loaded into this. And the payload of the total, the blue part nets out about 12%. So let's change something. If we change only the control rate, now the only thing I changed here was saying the data is still going at 86. I changed the control and management frames from six to 24. And now, oh, I saved some time. You can see it's less time. As a percentage, my blue part got bigger. I'm now up to 14%. Still not terribly efficient, but better. Of all of the bits and all the time I'm spending in the air, I increased three or 4% by just changing my control frames to be a little faster. 
something else we can look at. For the next one, next slide up, I'm now going to look at the payload. I'm comparing two other things. The top one and the bottom one on the top side here, we're talking about I'm changing the data rate only. Everything else stays the same. I'm now going to go and change my data rate from 86 to 300. And now my percentage is worse. Because the overhead stayed the same, I just made my data go faster. So my payload as a percent goes down, but my time also goes down. So I'm a little more efficient because I use less time, but as a ratio, not so good. The one below on this one, this one we just changed the frame size. I just went from a 512 to a 90 byte frame. And you can see when we leave everything the same and I go to that little 90 byte frame, less than 1% of my airtime is actually delivering payload. This is holds true for TCP acts, they're 90 bytes long. It holds true for voice frames. A whole lot of voice frames are really small and they can't be aggregated because they need to be going in real time. Wi-Fi is not efficient, but going to a frame size smaller, you can see it does take less time to transmit the air because there's less bits going in the air. The blue part got smaller. So those were a couple of ones using Aruba's tool and you can go in and play with Aruba's tool and try some of these your own. Hold everything constant, change one variable and see what the result is. I'm gonna switch up to Gehrman's tool now and show you they're just a different type of picture. It's doing the same thing. It's taking some decisions of how we set it up and change it. So the first one here is the same one I already did. I changed the control management from six meg at the top to 24 meg at the bottom. You can tell those pieces got a little smaller. Another thing I could change and turn protection mode off. So all the RTS CTSs go away and it tightens it up a little bit. Another change I could make, and this one I think is gonna be shocking for a lot of people when they look at it. I, I knew it intellectually, but until I ran the numbers, all of a sudden I went, oh yeah, that makes sense. The top one I changed from a 20 megahertz channel on top to a 40 megahertz channel. Oh wow, look how much time we saved. Yeah, not very much hardly any. And in these microseconds, it was, you can see they're both over 300 microseconds long and it's slightly shifted. What if we go from a 20 megahertz channel all the way to an 80 megahertz channel? Because 80 megahertz channels are so much better, right? And you can see here, it hardly even shifted at all. The only thing we changed was our payload. All the other parts still happened. So even when I say, yeah, I've got 80 megahertz channel because I have these really, I'm sending a lot of data. Not really. The only thing of the entire frame that you sent that's faster was the payload portion. Let's look at another thing people talk about, trying to save time. Again, airtime is the only thing we have to change. On this one, what we're doing is we're just changing spatial streams alone. I went from two spatial streams to one spatial stream. How much did it change? Slightly. So instead of looking at these one at a time, and, and I, I suggest you do this, get in this in the software, play with the Excel spreadsheets, change different numbers and see for yourself, what can we change that's gonna make a big difference? And on this next one, what I'm doing is I took the worst case scenario. The top line here is six meg control, 24 meg, and I put it as the max MBR, the fastest you'll allow it to go. Usually it's minimum, in this one I, I said that's the max we're gonna do. 20 megahertz channel with only an MCS of three and one spatial stream. So that's the worst Wi-Fi we can send. If you look at the MCS chart, it's the upper left corner. It's as bad as it gets. And then we're comparing it on the bottom one to a 24 meg control rate, 80 megahertz wide channel, MCS nine, the fastest we could go with two spatial strings. And yeah, how much did we really save? From about 450 to 300. So from the very best Wi-Fi to the very worst Wi-Fi, yeah, we only changed, what, 50% of the best or about a third of the worst is all we got better. So we've been thinking that it's about these numbers we're playing with. But when you look at the single frame, 
one frame itself, how much time it takes with its arbitration, with its contention window, with the legacy preambles and all the pieces we put out there, the changes in the payload, though nice, are not nearly as much as what our customers would think. The other side of looking at this is when we go, oh yeah, we're running uh, 1.3 gigahertz. By the way, this best case is 1.3 gigahertz throughput. Well, sorry, it's not, it's 866. I didn't do three spatial streams. But had I done three spatial streams, it wouldn't have changed that much. It doesn't actually deliver as what you think. The only thing that's gonna go out your ethernet port is the blue part. Everything else is just airtime and it's to make the protocol work. So when people are telling you, you need to get M gig to all of your APs, really? We're not pushing anywhere close to gigabit and one AP and one client is the fastest you'll ever make Wi-Fi go. If you add another client, they're gonna share the airtime. So if you can't cover one gig of throughput of the blue with one device on one AP, how are you ever gonna get it more when you add more clients? So this was to give you an idea of what one single frame looks like. If you need more information, here's some resources. The, a lot of this, if you wanna read about it, Chuck Lukaszewski made a fantastic document it's about very high density networks. It's not really about very high density networks. It's about how Wi-Fi actually works. So strongly recommend you read this VRD planning guide. Yes, it will help you if you're doing large public venues, but it actually helps you just understand how Wi-Fi works. I've also got a link here for the Aruba calculator and Germans calculator as well. If you just hit Germans website, you can see his blog and he's got a lot of good information there especially about how 8011AX is coming down the pike. Questions? All right, thanks, Keith. Um, uh, Jeremond in the Q&A, and I wanna invite everybody else to, to put in your questions. Uh, there are no stupid questions here. This is an advanced topic, so I'm sure if you have a question, other people have it too. But uh, Jeremond says, uh, Keith does a very good job using my calculator to show airtime consumption. Thank you. If Jermon says you got it right, it must be right. And no, I didn't try to find your flaws like you tempted me to. <laughs> yes. You know, one of the things that, that I took away from this um, is, is how inefficient using wide channels are. So we, you know, we looked at, uh, good though. well, those are the high data rates, but we, you know, we looked at those airtime uh, comparisons. And one of the things to take away is it's just the payload that actually uses the full width. All the other overhead we talked about is in that primary 20 megahertz channel for every frame um, uh, that gets transmitted to that, to or from that AP. So it's that 20 megahertz cool. channel gets really, really busy and the other sub-channels, no, even in a really saturated network. Yeah, and if you watch with the spectrum analyzer, it hardly ever get, uses the rest of the 80. What's worse, and some systems have uh, this OBSS problem, an overlapping BSS, where they would go uh, 40 megahertz wide, and one's 36 plus, and one's 40 minus, and now they have their primaries not touching, and so every time a primary goes, it doesn't shut the other one down, and so they end up fighting more. So if you're going yeah. to use 40s and 80s, always go the same direction. So if you're gonna go always to the right, then it's 36 plus, 44 plus, et cetera. And it even gets the same way with, with 80s. And one, one other comment for me is, is when you use a wider channel, the CCA process, the preamble and energy detect process is slower in those secondary channels than the primary. So that adds a little bit. And that's a different trigger rate too. Mm -hmm. your, your, your CCA thresholds change. There's a that's lot right. of more complexity going on there. And one of the techniques you can do, which even takes longer, is I'll go to the first primary 20 and send one RTS. And then I'll send another one on the next one and another one on the next one. And so I'll CTS RTS on each of those channels to make sure they're all clear before I send that little teeny payload. Yep. Um, 
So Martin says, what is the best way to increase wireless speed, taking all this into account? Uh, have no protection mode, and sometimes you don't have any control over that. That will take a, a chunk out of it. The real chunk that I really would like, and it's not, we don't have it yet. And I think we should, as a, as a community, push. In six gigahertz, we still have legacy preambles. That's the big chunk in front. We still have in six gigahertz and in AX, a AFES and a contention window. Those are the pieces that are really slowing us down. If you look at the timeline, arbitration is a third or more, sometimes 40, 50% of the entire time. So we can get faster by not doing it the way we used to do it. We had, I mean, LTE has been doing this for a long time. They're way more efficient than we are. We should think about changing the protocol. We have a chance when we move to six gig to make some pretty substantial changes in the way it works. It doesn't have to be backward compatible. As we move from A to B to G to N to AC, we've had to stay backward compatible, which means we have those big, ugly, nasty things out there. In six gig, we can probably get around that. Yeah. Yeah, the good uh, um, lead into a question from Hector who says, so that's why Wi-Fi 6 and OFDMA will bring us much needed improvements. <laughs> I know. I'm just laughing because that's what marketing people say. I I've yet to see it work cleanly, yeah. efficiently, all the time. On the flip side, though, and I, and I don't think it's OFDMA. I don't have proof yet, but, but Fernay and I did a bunch of uh, testing. Wi-Fi 5 versus Wi-Fi 6 APs and Wi-Fi 5 versus Wi-Fi 6 clients. Wi-Fi 6 clients were cont across the board faster on all APs. Wi-Fi 6 APs were faster even with Wi-Fi 5 clients across all APs and across all clients. Wi-Fi 6 devices, the chipsets, are more efficient at doing what they're doing whether or not uh, you have a Wi-Fi 6 client. So yeah, if you want your client faster, go to Wi-Fi 6. If you want your network faster, go to Wi-Fi 6 APs. Um, the other thing we found is more spatial streams, the eight by eight spatial streams, beat the pants off of four by fours. Just because there is a chance of putting that back together. MRC still works. You give MRC more possible channels to put together, you get better data coming off of it. And the, the data is amazing. At 100 meters, even an iPhone's pushing 60 meg. Wi-Fi goes a long way. Wow. One comment I would add to that too is, uh, is even though OFDMA has the potential to increase efficiency while it's operating, OFDMA happens inside this whole uh, process that, that we just talked about today. So yeah, we keep talking about all that overhead doesn't go away. All that I overhead is still there. I might have three blues happening simultaneously. All the non-blue is still there. Right. The block hack just might have to say a little more. So if you just say, for, for ease of sake, triple the size of the blue or double the size of the blue, that's the only benefit you're going to get from OFDMA if and when it works. Correct. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, a lot of questions about uh, wide channels. I think we talked about that. Question from Mike. Can you summarize how this applies to real life design considerations relative to what to avoid and what to emphasize? Oh, from, from my standpoint, it's pretty easy. Minimize CCI. That's your number one thing. Because it's the fewer times you have to bump into other people, then you get better results. So minimize CCI everywhere you can. Use QoS because it's going to save slightly your your Contention window time is going to go down because you have, instead of your random back off bigger, it's got its smaller pools. So you can you can help in that point. So from a design standpoint, use the widest channel you can until you can't. Because there is some efficiencies in the wider channels. But if you're going to cause co-channel interference by using a wide channel, then it hurts. So the rule is use the widest until you can't. I rarely see a chance where you can use more than 20s. Just put in 20s everywhere. It's it, the, the actual benefit for the blue data payload is so little 
that if I even have any co-channel interference chance, it's better to go to 20s. So faster data rates, yes. You saw the blue got smaller. Uh, that just means the percentage of overhead got bigger. But we were faster. So for every single frame, we're trying to be faster. What we want to do is minimize the use of airtime. So if I can design so every client gets on and off the network faster, I save time. It's just not a lot of time, maybe from 350 down to 310. So as a percentage, it's not that big of a deal. What we do want to do is get rid of protection mode. That helps. We all we can't do that all the time. Um, use short guard interval rather than log guard interval. That's a little time. I mean, we want it's a whole bunch of little teeny things we can do to make the whole net aggregate go better. As you saw in that last slide, from the very best uh, MCS nine, two spatial streams, 80 megahertz wide versus the worst MCS zero in a 20 megahertz with long guard interval. Maybe we save a third. So yeah, I mean, every bit helps. It's just not what you think. When we say we're going to 867, that's the payload rate. It's not all the other rest of the parts. And uh, maybe time, uh, Don, for one last question. Here's one from uh, Germond again. As we know, 802.11a is more effective than 802.11ax on shorter frame sizes. So I think that was related to uh, talking about the preambles and all the overhead related to 802.11ax, probably assuming, you know, single user operation. Yeah, yeah. So the, the benefit for AX are only if you have AX clients doing AX things. And he's just picked out a single way. Yes, if you do set this up, it's a little more efficient. True. But who's going to be designing 802.11a networks today? So. Yes, true, but who cares? Gotcha. All right. Awesome. Guys, uh, great job today. Keith, I enjoyed watching the presentation. Jim, thanks for uh, dropping in and helping with the color and Q&A. Uh, great job all around. Everybody, thanks for joining us today. Before you log off, uh, Kelsey is going to drop in a link for registering for next week's uh, oh, webinar. Another, oh, yeah. Trivia question you missed. Ah, I know. So uh, I didn't get to mention this in the in the pre-conference, but uh, that question was too long. I get I couldn't. Oh, 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 it the, sorry. <laughs> I just want to see if everyone was listening. If they got it, they should get 100 percent right if they listened. I'll send out a survey afterwards and see how they did. Um, uh, the so answer is it depends. <laughs> it usually is. That usually is these answers. Uh, so before everyone logs off, we've got um, a link that we're going to share uh, for next week's webinar to register. Uh, it's with Dave Hallis, introduction of uh, the IEEE 802.11ba wake-up radio operation. So a good introductory uh, webinar next week as well. So please join us for that. Have a great rest of the week, everybody. Thanks again, Keith, for joining us. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Keith. Thank <laughs> you.